Well, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're excited to have this discussion. I think there'll be some people still trickling in after lunch, so no problems there. Um, we purposely kind of organized the two sessions, the one before lunch. Who here, by the way, was here at the one before lunch? Did anyone manage to make that? So there were four, four or five papers that were really interesting, different case studies, and one kind of taking more of a meta view on policies and how, uh, and, and kind of the more, um, um, uh, yeah, essentially global policy and how we can kind of, you know, whether there's a right to livable space and, and whether that could be something that could be part of the Paris Agreement. So we're gonna have a really interesting discussion. Uh, for, we want to kind of carve out 45 minutes at the end of this session, so really keep our, our presentations brief. I'm presenting on what David Rathel, myself, and Harold Sturley, and others organized uh, as part of a Population Environment Research Network cyber seminar or online seminar back in March. Uh, so I'm going to be going through very quickly some of the presentations, uh, not like the full presentations, but a few uh, selected slides from, from that session, uh, which was really meant to lead into this um, conference. And so my own framing of these issues kind of comes uh, from back in as an undergrad at Dartmouth, actually, uh, I was uh, remember, you know, hearing about George Perkins Marsh and man and nature and the kind of this was considered by some the launch of the modern conservation movement and the sense of the, the man-land relationship. Well, of course, we've evolved since then, and it's human environment or socio-ecological systems or whatever you want to call it, but it still goes back, I think, to some of this early thinking in the 19th century. Uh, I also was informed by this diagram, many of you are familiar with it, from the IPCC assessment, sixth, uh, fifth assessment, uh, which Kirsten Dow and others came, came up with, which basically looks at these th risk thresholds where you get beyond the you know, impacts that are beyond a certain uh, threshold that are very difficult for people to adapt to. And then the question then naturally arises, do people leave those areas or do you somehow develop a new and transformative approach to the economies in those areas? Um, this is just an example for rice culture, but you could imagine just about any other kind of threshold that might be surpassed. Uh, and then Radley in the back and myself and David and Michael Oppenheimer wrote this piece uh, in 2021 where we started to try to reconcile the top-down view that's coming from a lot of the geophysical models, which is easy to do if you have a, have a you know, GCM and you can couple it with something uh, like heat thresholds or desertification or the return periods of a certain uh, SPEI, um, in other words, the drought index, and just sort of say, oh, these areas, you know, are suddenly going to be in really bad shape. And so maybe, um, you know, it's a way of, I guess, communicating the risks. The rationale for the cyber seminar, and I'll get back to those kind of top down versus the bottom up in, in a little bit, but, um, and we, we really wanted to emphasize that that top down is not sufficient. So we, we approached this cyber seminar with the goals of kind of revisiting some of these dialogues that started 50 years ago with Limits of Growth and the Stockholm Conference, uh, even, dare I say it, people like Garrett Hardin, um, you know, and others who are, you know, uh, not our favorites, maybe for all of our favorites today. But, you know, they were really concerned about, in Paul, Paul Ehrlich, for that matter, you know, they were concerned about the limits and the thresholds and what would happen. And, of course, even then, at that time, climate change was really not a dialogue, a matter of, you know, public debate very much. There were a few scattered reports and some scientists beginning to think about it in the 1970s, but it wasn't viewed at that time as a potentially global risk. Uh, so, you know, there are suggestions that at the global level, there's these potentially systemic global existential risks. Uh, there's also potential issues in given localities. And we wanted to kind of get beyond the dialogues around carrying capacity, environmental determinism, and see if there's new approaches that acknowledge human agency and the potential for locally and globally creative solutions. Uh, so we paired to uh, partners. I work with CSEN, which is at the Climate School, and we run the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. We work with IUSSP, Future Earth, and the Habitable Project, 
I hope Sir Harold Sterley is online now, but I don't know if someone can give me some indication. He is good. So I am Harold. Nice to nice that you're here. Um, and we're going to have you speak right after David. Um, and we really and, and we also explicitly link this to the management retreat conference. There is a YouTube video online. Uh, if you want to see the kind of we do a webinar before the cyber seminar to kind of prime the pump a little bit and get all the ideas out there. It's about an hour and a half long and uh, that's the link to it if you if you want to write that down. Um, so we're excited to bring some of these ideas forward in this space where we can actually discuss them in person. I'm going to summarize uh, four, five of the presentations and of course David's here and Harold's online so he'll be they'll be presenting their own work uh, in, in, uh, independently of my presentation. So we wanted to have someone, uh, Aliu actually was supposed to be here at Manage Retreat, um, but he's uh, in Kanos, uh, Nigeria. So this is one of those places you could say is a frontline city or community where, you know, if there's any kind of place in the world where people think about thresholds and maybe limits to habitability, it's the Sahel. And so he's been thinking about some of these issues and you know he sets out the context of the Sahel. Uh, those who you don't know, you're not going to learn about it in this slide. But it's a dry area, and it's right at the border of the Sahara. And it's really, for decades, been considered one of those places. Like they thought that, in fact, the droughts were due to land change. And of course, the climate scientists at Lamont and at IRI and elsewhere have actually dis proven that and said it's really about sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic that's caused the droughts of the 1980s. But for a long time, this has been kind of a pit post, uh, poster child potentially of a Malthusian kind of situation where, you know, uh, you've got vicious circle cycles of, of population growth and land degradation and drought. Um, of course, now we know the drought's not caused by, by land, land change. And, you know, he laid out some of the numbers of people who are displaced from the Sahel uh, in, 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 the, in the region. We know the Lake Chad has also become a poster you know, child as a were of this issue in many ways, um, and, and rightly or wrongly. I, I know the situation in Lake Chad personally because I traveled up there in the 1990s, and you know, basically the lake has been bled dry by dams that are upstream. So if you don't know that, all you think is, oh, climate change is causing this problem. Well, actually, it was a lot of other things that go into why Lake Chad has dried out. Um, and so he talked a bit about language and linguistic issues and how you refer to the most vulnerable. Um, I'm not going to be able to do any of these presentations justice. I just want to give you a snapshot of what was kind of discussed. Carol Farbotko, uh, who wanted to come but is unable to come to New York for this meeting, um, talked a lot about Oceania and the kind of concepts of uninhabitability and this sort of notion of in, in, in inevitable uninhabitability, which is a political narrative as well as a scientific question. Uh, and she, she basically pushes back on that and, and talks about, you know, uh, the resistance of atoll nations to this notion that somehow they're going to be inevitably disappear or erased from uh, the surface of the planet. Um, we also wanted to hear from the team that put together that PNAS article that some of you probably read, um, which talked about existential threats and risks to our planet. Um, these are some of the, uh, Luke Kemp was kind enough to join us. Um, I, I felt from hearing him at an NAS panel that, um, you know, as dire as some of the warnings they give are, and maybe, you know, some feel overly dire, uh, that he very uh, well articulated the need to at least consider these sort of uh, um, higher order impacts and the kinds of Im Im implications, the high risk low probability events. And so these are the kind of terminology, and he talked about end game territory, levels of global warming and societal fr fragility that are judged sufficiently probable to constitute climate change as an ex extinction threat. Um, and um, he talks about layers of catastrophe, starting from the anthropocene, and this is really kind of a top down view uh, where you go from this earth system responses, climate change impacts to societal fragility and human responses. This is a, a, a projection of population, actually a data set that we disseminate um, at, at our CDAC. And uh, Brian Jones, who I've worked with a lot 
developed these projections. And, um, but what he shows in crosshatching is areas where they uh, probably overlay the, the zoo at all XU um, in PNAS kind of heat threshold uh, and just sort of, you can tally up the numbers and say, oh gosh, there's gonna be an awful lot of people in some of these areas. Um, then the end game research agenda, which is exploring extreme earth states, modeling mass mortality and morbidity, understanding societal fragility. Uh, what was the last one? Integrated climate catastrophe assessments, all pretty dire and dark stuff. Uh, and then he kind of overlays um, those places where uh, the cross hatching exists and you've got really fragile states and potential um, bad outcomes as far as governance and, and the ability to kind of um, work one, one's way out of these situations. So David O'Byrne um, from Lund University joined us and talked about really more of a capability approach. Uh, and he referred to migration mobility as descriptive, neither good nor bad, but habitability is very much a normative assessment. You know, if you are declining on habitability, that's normatively bad. Um, and so he brought that in and then talked about habitability as freedom, which kind of resonates with what you, Simona, and uh, uh, Ellen were talking about before. Um, he he take, borrows a lot from Amartya Sen, habitability, the capability set available to inhabitants from basic nutrition, um, contextual, socially defined, uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm not gonna read this to you, but this is kind of his line of thinking. And I'm gonna try to summarize some of these different strands uh, in a moment. Um, so habitability is the outcome of contentious political processes, Normative approach requires evaluation of the capacity of the state, civil society, and other actors to contribute to habitability. Uh, and then he, he talks about it as an emerging concept, um, but we need to look at its normative content very carefully. Um, and that freedom is a very central concept in all of this. Uh, the last of the presentations that I'm summarizing here was Maria Gavonell's, and she, uh, I believe, is part of the Habitable Project as well. Um, and she talks a lot about social tipping points. And I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, so basically she talks about the SES, uh, there's points at which a small quantitative change in climate variability triggers a nonlinear change in out migration rates. And that might be considered a social tipping point where suddenly a threshold is reached or breach, but the, the social tipping point itself in a way then engenders perhaps further out migration as places become less viable economically. Um, habitability, the capacity of SES to sustain the lives and livelihoods of the human population that forms part of it. Francois Jemen, the leader on the Habitable Project um, wrote that. And um, so there's interaction effects and um, you know a big focus on lives and livelihoods. Uh, this is the idea that um, and I, I forget how she interpreted this. I'm sorry, I feel like um, um, uh, I'm, I'm doing, not doing justice to these great and rich presentations, but I wanted to give you a taste of what was it. So there's these thresholds that result in from going from habitable to less habitable to totally uninhabitable. Um, and then there's this kind of flow diagram that, that describes how risks uh, intersect with adaptive capacity and uh, social capital and things like that, place attachment. Uh, I think a lot of an important strand of new climate mobility research is about place attachment. So my summary coming out of this was sort of um, that um, habitability of SESs has physical dimension and a socially constructed dimension related to capabilities and an emotive dimension, which we need to be aware of, is a place attachment and a sense of place as home. This is something that Susie Moser was getting at last night as we were convening in the interactive session. Habitability is emergent property. A place cannot be easily defined as being habitable or uninhabitable, but its habitability is being is revealed through other variables or after successive shocks. David has one way of defining it and we'll let him define it later uh, as the accumulation of individually based determinations of habitability, uh, which may result in out migration. Uh, David's also gonna talk more about these three dimensions of habitability, um, but climate change reduces the level of habitability of an SES up to a point at which small perturbation could trigger, that's the point that Maria Gavanaugh was making, trigger a social tipping point 
summary slide two, uh, in both Rathal's and Gabonel's definitions, the ability of societies to respond and adapt is critical. Uh, where there is a breakdown in adaptive capacity, so governance structures, uh, government ability to act, then there is an increased likelihood of either outmigration or involuntary, involuntary immobility or trapped populations. The state has an important role in determining habitability, so habitability is also a political consideration, and that also gets to some of the normative issues. Teleconnections affect habitability. I believe Harold's going to talk more about that, but you know, some places rely entirely on imports um, you know, from somewhere else, like the uh, Abu Dhabi or UAE in some ways. Uh, they're really dependent on their fossil fuel exports in, in return for food and other things. Uh, but there are also uh, teleconnections through remittances and trade. Habitability is socially differentiated, which raises questions of for who and which groups can we talk about habitability? And it's a normative concept. Where is it threatened? So can we point to places on the map now today and say the Mekong, which we heard about earlier, or Northern Ghana, are these places, you know, I mentioned the Sahel earlier, uh, places where we can say thresholds are about to be breached, the Horn of Africa. Uh, maybe some would consider that already a threshold that has been breached, say in Somalia. Um, breakdown of governance and conflict certainly seems to be associated with declining habitability, but does calling Haiti, Somalia, or the Lake Chad Basin uninhabitable or areas of rapidly declining habitability really tell us something new or point to some novel policy response that we wouldn't already think of when we have these really difficult and, and, and challenging situations? I also worry a bit about the risks of redlining countries for ODA, official development assistance, and foreign direct investment. Suddenly, it's like, you know, I was actually talking to a company, uh, owner of a company that does water assessments, and he said the response of some of his clients, which are big name, uh, let's put it this way, beverage producers, is, oh, if water's going to be a problem in that area, we're just pulling out. You know, we're not going to continue to produce our goods in that particular area. We'll just import them, import them from somewhere else. Or is habitability and only useful in describing SESs that are under threat somehow where you could take some proactive measure. So you're not talking about the Horn of Africa, now you're talking about maybe Central India. Robin, are you in the room? Or somewhere else, you know, uh, where we say, well, you know, there's some warning signs and maybe we could do something to prevent the tipping point that Maria Gavinal talks about. Um, so I think there's questions about what habitability uh, covers or captures that we don't already have? Should we focus on risk and uncertainty in an era where both seem to be increasing at disconcerting rates? Uh, Luke, Lucas Kemp brought that in, and I thought that was a useful, you know, the kind of risk management perspective. Um, should we retain older concepts such as carrying capacity, uh, or is it, a, you know, one person who is maybe more neo-Malthusian in our cyber seminar came in with a, you know, really, let's just be, name the elephant in the room, it's population growth, and that's really the big issue. So I'm, I'm just trying to bring out these different issues so that we don't self-censor. I think we need to have honest discussions around these things, okay? Um, so um, here are some, you know, um, our, my thinking about how this relates to managed retreat is essentially that managed retreat tends to be more focused on certain types of places, fire risk, low elevation coastal zones. Um, it tends to focus more on advanced developed countries and these kind of technical packages and tax incentives and other things that, uh, uh, and, that ha and these are countries that have really good and well-developed risk mitigation strategies such as insurance and hard infrastructure. Most of the low-income countries self-insure. In other words, your family members bail you out if you, or you know, somebody. We heard about Ghana. It's the person who sends remittances home. Everyone can eventually go to that household and ask for some food or something if things get really bad because they actually you know, have a little bit more resources than others. Would a more technical definition of habitability help administrative agencies to make scientifically grounded determinations as to when an area is habitable or not in, in ways that trigger policy responses? Uh, what would be the pros and cons of using such an approach? On the other hand, what are the pros and cons of laissez-faire approach that just leaves it to individuals in the market to determine if a place is habitable? We talked about that in the last session, but I think it's a really um, important question because the latent risks are getting are high and are getting higher. Uh, 
Uh, these are a bunch of key questions that we posed for the cyber seminar. I'm not going to, what I might do is bring these up later as we discuss. And if you see a question in there that you think is really interesting and you want to pursue it in our discussion, feel free to do it. I'm not going to read these. Uh, thank you very much. So with that, um, thank you. My name is David Rothall. I'm an associate professor at Oregon State University. Oh, I should probably get this in my face. This is a really wonderful audience uh, to be sharing this, this idea with. Um, yeah, I think you did a great job, Alex, summarizing uh, some of the main contours of this emerging concept in the debate. Um, it is a fraught um, uh, academic concept. Um, but oops, let's see. We can there just go go. straight to here. This is this is the way we advance. Um, so I just want to say uh, to introduce this. The um, an IP. I was in the IPCC sixth assessment, and I was coordinating the treatment of questions of habitability and migration across the second working group, which is impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And uh, so we were tasked with assessing what we know about habitability. This was a mandate, right, that was given to us by the, the co-chairs and the, the folks who put together the, the IPCC assessment. And so as we're looking through the literature, we really found almost nothing on habitability, despite this being a driving, uh, you know, the, the driving uh, research demand for this topic. So let's remember, the, I, the IPCC itself, the justification for it, was that we needed to know about parts of the planet that might be rendered uninhabitable. At the first COP of the, uh, the UNF Triple C, Atik Rahman, a friend and colleague who may, many of you may know, he was on the Bangladesh uh, uh, delegation. Uh, he, this is the headline that emerges from the first COP. If you make our homelands uninhabitable, we will march with our wet feet into your living rooms. And so there is the whole conversation on, on habitability and migration. This is sort of that, that dominates the headlines. And here we are 27 years later without a clear definition. Um, so definitions are key for research and for policy. Um, I would say that there's a justice argument for making a clear definition that we can measure habitability and changes in habitability because only with a clear definition can we document cases where there has been a shift or a loss of habitability. And then uh, lastly, knowing what habitability is and understanding its determinants, we can promote, we can preserve, we can expand habitability for the rest of the planet. Um, we can sort of, we can have a different vision of habitability rather than just thinking of ways that we might lose it. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. The, the, um, in the time I have, I'll set up a definition, I'll provide a formal definition, and this is gonna be an equation. For those of you who don't like equations, this is, we've got math class today. Um, and then, uh, but we'll, but it, it's fine. It's, this is a, a sort of formal arrangement of, of important concepts. And then I'll just conclude with a couple of uh, things that we don't have time to discuss here. So um, this is a, a very valuable place to start. This is, um, I'm showing you pictures from a long term, a longitudinal uh, monitoring project that I am running in the northern coast of Honduras, uh, which includes Santa Rosa de Awan. This is Don Jose Arauz sitting in the remains of the primary school in Santa Rosa de Aguan, um, which was destroyed by a hurricane. Um, and so those of you who are kind of following me here, what, how do you live in a place if you don't have a primary school? Okay, so I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna base some of my examples on this longitudinal study. Um, and I think it's very important for setting the context here. So this is 1998, you're looking at the, the center of Santa Rosa de Aguan, which was known as sort of the capital of Garifuna culture. This is a parade. Um, this is a the sort of a corner store that that function had a very important social function in the community. Um, this is the center of activity, center of culture, uh, center of economy, commerce. Um, there are government buildings around this area. This is before uh, Hurricane Mitch, and this is after in 2009 um, when I visited. At one point, I had been there before, but this is the 2009 image, and so you'll see these arrows are pointing to the same. Um, elements that would have been in the in the landscape totally changed. Um, people who've left, and this is the same image. So you'll see these arrows. Whoops. Let's see. Let me go back. Um, the same arrows, uh, 2021. And hopefully we'll make it back next year with uh, with the project that we've got with Alex. Um, so um, 
let me see if I can, can you see this definition? This is the definition that we're, we're going with. This is a kind of a verbal definition. We'll go into a formal one, right? Um, the habitability is the environmental conditions in a particular setting that support healthy and safe human life, productive livelihoods, and sustainable intergenerational development where people possess the capaci capacities to collectively manage risks of all kinds. Okay, so that's a mouthful, that's a lot, and I think we can put it in, in clearer terms than this. But something that I wanna emphasize here from this definition, um, we, we, we're drawing from the climate change adaptation literature, community insights, this is very involved and we don't have time to go into detail. But from this, we prioritize a set of impacts or losses and damages that can occur in the course, in the experience of climate hazards that are associated with physical safety and psychological safety. So physical safety, including um, you know, threats to housing, food, uh, water, security, um, and psychological safety. If there are in, in people that, that experience overwhelming stress from climate hazards report trauma and uh, a lack of an inability to live in a place uh, with a sense of safety, whether or not the hazard returns or is present. So that's also important. Livelihood resilience, this comes from the sustainable livelihoods literature. We know those of us who study migration, we know how important livelihoods are in the, in the migration decision making. If you can't really live in a, you can't really live in a place unless you can earn a living in that place. And so that's just suffice to say, livelihoods are very important uh, a loss that can emerge. Um, that, yeah. Okay, and then lastly, the, this a lot has been spoken on this, but communities will have a, a collective capacity to manage risk or to adapt to risk and that sometimes this capacity itself is eroded because of climate hazards this is also an important consideration if we start to lose this capacity then habitability is at risk okay so i want to put our feet on the ground before we launch into an equation this is bataya honduras this is the to the north is um, the caribbean to the south is a river and what you're seeing is before and after satellite imagery before and after a, a cyclone um, flooded out the community. And I, and, and I wanna put our feet on the ground so we know unequivocally what habitability, a shift in habitability means. So this is a much longer video, but I'll just narrate it to you quickly um, uh, of the flood in Bataya. So this is, um, you're seeing standing flood water. Again, you know, so this is a, a community on the Caribbean coast. The soil is kind of the sandy, loamy substrate. It, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't take too much for, that, uh, for a current to start to erode the soil very, very quickly. And so that's what happens. There's standing flood water. It turns into a current as the, as the flood breaches through the community. And so this breach is carving away land within the space of minutes and hours. And so, as you see, I've got this, this little video showing uh, the, the speed at which this flood destroys a house, a residence, you know, safety, if someone's the object of someone's physical safety. And so it's moving through here, and, and what you see is the community sort of standing around, and they're in the, if, if the audio we're playing, you'd hear them making commentary, like, wow, that's crazy, look at that. But then at a certain stage, after the first two houses um, wash out to sea, everybody realizes the danger that the whole community is in. And so they start to step away from the bank and start to evacuate their houses. And so, um, so people return to the houses, they're removing things from their houses, they're starting to enter, put them into fishing boats um, and, and trying to get people out of, of, of harm's way. One person died in this. Um, luckily, this, the flood happened during the daytime so people could see and they could sort of maneuver. But, the same sorts of flooding can happen at night, and that's that's tragic, that's fatal. And so eventually, fishermen come from other places to help with the evacuation process. And then within a space of hours, the same afternoon, we're seeing, this is, we're gonna see a survey of this from right here where you're seeing, he's surveying from here, and he's gonna pan to the north. All of this was the community and it's all gone in the space of hours. So I wanna be unequivocal. When we're talking about a change in habitability, this is what I mean, you cannot live here anymore. Um, so, is there, and, and we could debate that. I mean, even that is debatable. But um, these are the cases that I think we can, where we can say there was a shift in habitability. Okay, so just, just very quickly, last, last idea here. Um, you know, so when we think about uh, this, uh, my, uh, 
Habitability is a, a, a shift, a social ecological shift, a kind of a, we call these state shifts in a complex system. Um, there's a link to migration and it's sort of, um, it's teleological, right? When a place becomes uninhabitable, then people migrate, right? Because you can't live there, you have to migrate. Um, um, so, uh, sorry, did I use the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a uh, teleological, philosophers, is that right? Tautological, thank you. Um, so, sorry, <laughs> I was thinking on my feet and I grabbed the wrong word. Okay, so uh, so th you recognize this from the IPCC assessment. Um, this is uh, this should look familiar. There's the propeller diagram. We've got non-climatic factors, climate change, uh, experience of the climate hazard requires some response. Typically, what we expect, what we hope, is in situ adaptation. And if we're successful, then re then risk decreases. But um, if in situ adaptation is insufficient, then we might need um, um, ex situ adaptation, which, which includes migration. And so there's a whole set of, uh, at a specific threshold, there are a series of mobility responses that we might ex expect, anticipate. And so not to get into this, but there, we, we can, there is a, a relationship between shifting habitability, this threshold moment, and mobility outcomes. And so what we would add here, this didn't appear in the IPCC, but this arrow that leads back to the original conditions and sort of a, um, a sort of continuing of this process of, of risk increasing. Okay, so now, here we go. Steal yourselves an equation. Okay, um, so this is the formal definition for habitability. And I'm proposing this because this is what really this, let's think about this use our quantitative minds to think about this is a formal arrangement of um, of concepts that are useful in understanding whether or not we have seen a shift in habitability. So um, uh, habitability is when H equals is derived from the average of the sum of individual determinations about habitability in a given setting. So that's what this means. In a given setting N, the, the average of summed individual determinations, and that's this here, individual determinations. We'll come back to this. Um, so, um, and determinations about two specific things, at least. So, and the first determination is about safety, we talked about safety and the second is, am I, am I doing okay? Pointer, that's fine. Thanks, <laughs> thanks. Uh, determinations about safety, that's over here on this, this term, and um, livelihoods and the second. So this is a fractional relationship between this AC on the top and the E and the S on the bottom. And so when we have a fraction, we know that when the, when the numerator is large, then we get a large uh, term on the other side of the equation, right? And so adap AC refers to the capacity to adapt, and the bottom is sensitivity. This is our sensitivity uh, interacted with exposure. And so the, this would be our threshold on the bottom. And so typically in the past, we've emphasized the threshold on the bottom when considering uh, habitability. So these specific thresholds around heat, for example, or sea level rise, for example, drought or desertification. These are the thresholds that we are concerned with. And the idea here is that this is, there's a fractional relationship. And if the, that uh, threshold is countervailed um, with adaptive capacity, then um, a place can, then we can sustain habitability in it. So let's just um, take a look at this for a second. Exposure and sensitivity. Um, this is from the paper that Radley led just a couple years ago where we try to set out some key, key um, issues of sensitivity. So this is, these are um, like the thresholds. So these were, um, we showed this in this paper, but these are also emphasized in the IPCC as problems of particular concern. So this is what you're looking at is um, dots that go from blue to green along coastlines, and then this sort of uh, tan to black color um, over the land. And so the, the dots refer to sea level rise, flood return periods, and then the tan images over land, tan to black, are about wet bulb global temperature return periods. So essentially what we're seeing is that where the, where the, the dots get bluer, we, we have more frequent inundation events um, due to local sea level um, 
um, pressures. We, we think about global, global mean sea level rise, but there's local sea level rise, which is, turns out is, is pretty important. And so then, then what, what, so this is a threshold. If once, when we get floods, when we're inundated once a month, this becomes problematic. Um, similarly, the wet global temperature is, is an, this is an expression of a, a moment at which the human body doesn't do well, um, given the temperatures. And so if, if we look across this in terms of these specific thresholds, exposure and sensitivity, um, not all places look the same. And so um, from this, you know, we, we, it, South Asia and East Asia does look to be, um, like it may experience uh, these, these threshold events. Um, okay, so back to this. The, let's look at the top of the equation here. And we don't have time to get into the details and other presenters have spoken about this. We've heard a lot about this in, in the conference, um, adaptive capacity. And there are folks here in the room, I would say Susie, who's worked on, on, uh, on uh, barriers to adaptation, very important stuff. So the idea here is that adaptive capacity is is we can derive it from a set of resources or, or assets from which capacity uh, adaptation is attained um, minus the barriers and limits or soft and hard limits to adaptation as we as we called them in the IPCC. Um, so I'll just say, um, yeah, uh, we could we could discuss this at length. So in the cases of the Garifuna villages where you saw this flood happen. Um, we can think there's some very clear adaptation barriers and limits. Um, there's no available land around the, those communities. So there's not a place to which those people could settle due to um, you know, the private property ownership around those communities and a government that's not um, institutionally set up to help resettlement. Um, so we could talk about uh, local barriers to adaptation in detail. Um, so when we think about high sensitivity, low adaptive capacity, we can start to go global. Jamin Vandenhoek, who's here at this conference, can talk in detail about this. Um, some of his work on refugees and um, climate change moving forward um, under different emission scenarios becomes really useful for illustrating problems of habit. Oh, there's Jamin right there sitting, sitting on the ground. Hello. Um, OK, so uh, we see uh, this, what's being expressed here that showed up in our in chapter eight of the IPCC, uh, refugee camps and IDP camps um, expressed um, with a background of annual mean near surface air temperature in the between the years 2040 and the year uh, 2059. And so if we zoom in, we see these high concentrations of refugee camps in areas where, where temperatures are high. And the problem here is that the, many of these refugee camps cons consist of encamped people who have limits, who have policy constraints on their ability to leave these places. This is a barrier to adaptation. This could be changed if we wanted to. This is a mutable aspect of adaptation. Um, it's um, but representative of, of one of the problems, the habitability problems. Okay, so I just want to sort of, I'm, I'm very close to the end. I want to talk about an individual, this, this question of individual subjective determination of habitability versus a intersubjective determination that we might make together. And I feel like this is really important. This needs a lot more work. Um, okay, so this is, um, you know, we, after we can compute some of an individual's, um, uh, you know their habit, their individual habitability thresh, threshold in terms of in terms of physical, psychological safety, and in livelihoods, we can compute a curve for that person. So I want to just kind of illustrate how this might work. This is Tia Checha, who's from Santa Rosa de Aguan, again, um, persisted in this very dangerous neighborhood, um, and we could talk about why that was in detail, why it was she stayed there, and it was due to. Um, so you can see what this, these arrows are meant to point the same, you know, there's the same location just um, before and after the house behind Tia Checha is gone, as well as neighborhoods of streets in front of her. She's now on the beach and she was before quite a distance from it. Okay, so um, because of livelihood stability, uh, Tia Checha was, was able to stay in this location. And so this is kind of her position on this hypothetical um, habitability curve. Um, but so the, the idea, if you go, if we go back to the beginning of this definition, 
is that we would we take an average of the sum of all individual determinations, subjective determinations about um, habitability. That's one way of doing it. And that's an important, let's start there. It's a good place to start, but how about um, we could think about individual uh, weights. So the, in the last session, we talked about planners and the weight that planners determinations make. Um, and so a planner would be much heavily, more heavily weighted in their determination than a marginalized person. And so we might, th we might think about weighting um, as, as an important way to, to sum and average. Um, also, we could think about networks, uh, a networked term, how individuals come to decisions together or how we think about the same things together as households, as communities, as, as ethnic groups, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is to be determined how this would be all worked out. Um, and I, I'm just, I, I'm cognizant of time. Uh, I should probably wrap it up. Yeah, okay. So um, lots I could say on this, but this is just a, it's, <laughs> I'll skip it. Um, so at the end, uh, unless you want to hear it, I can go back and question and answer. Okay, so um, it's a cool, it's an interesting anecdote about intersubjectivity and determinations that we come that we come to. Um, so the the what I'm trying to express here is that once we we come up with the right way of aggregating individual subjective determinations about habitability, we can plot out uh, a safe habitable space, and we can think about. Um, yeah, sort of a, a the, the minimum habitability space. Um, and so I think this is just sort of a useful starting point for this this conversation. And um, I'll, I'll skip this as well. I'll just tantalize you with this interesting um, way of, of thinking about signals that might emerge in different in these different dimensions of habitability as we cross specific thresholds around safety, around um, uh, livelihoods and around our capacity to respond, things we might look for. Uh, final thoughts, the rate at which adaptation occur occurs. Um, this is, if you find yourself in a world you don't recognize, then that world to you might subjectively be uninhabitable. Um, this is something to be reckoned with. Um, intersubjectivity and power, I sort of referenced that with planners, but you know, we have to consider political economies, powerful actors, um, questions of marginality, discrimination, and how those might play into intersubjectivity. Um, uh, isn't this just environmental determinism? Alex raised some of these questions, and I think we should discuss that um, ourselves. I would say no, because it's drawing from the, the very clear and strong body of literature around vulnerability, which addresses structural vulnerability, and also sustainable livelihoods, which also addresses these, these things. And not to say that this, so we, let's just be careful we don't wade into that, that, that same very fraught and dangerous territory. Um, so lastly, um, yeah, I think this is really important to consider because we can, we can imagine ways, the justice implications of extending habitability. Um, and then I'll just, I'll just end it right there. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Super interesting stuff, and your thinking on this keeps getting, you know, progressing, so that's great to see. Um, stop sharing, and we're going to let Harold share his screen. So, Harold, welcome, and um, we haven't, you know, introduced ourselves extensively, but if you want to say a word or two about who you are, that would be great, and then you can launch into your presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex. Can you hear me? Are you still muted? Is um, No, that should be, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, uh, we can. Okay. We can yeah. now. You might want to speak up a bit, but um, yeah. Okay, so I speak up a bit. So if that works, perfect. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much, um, Alex and David, for for um, your introduction and your your brilliant inputs and presentations. Um, so my name's Harold. I'm uh, afraid that I'm not able to be there in person, but uh, I'm happy to be here uh, remotely. Um, I'm talking to you from uh, Europe, so I'm part of a research project called Habitable that I will briefly introduce. Um, I'm based at the University of Vienna, um, researching um, the relationship between environmental changes, um, human mobilities, and now in this context, also habitability. Yeah, let me just jump into the without much further ado, jump into the uh, presentation. Can you can you see that? Perfect. 
So I just go through here. Um, well, I want to briefly introduce this, this project, Habitable, um, linking climate change, habitability, and social tipping points. Um, it's a research project funded by the European Commission Horizon 2020 um, funding scheme with the aim of better understanding how climate change and environmental change affects changes of habitability and how that um, translates into human mobility, migration and displacement. Um, it's a fairly large project with uh, more than 20 partners in 17 countries, uh, running still uh, almost two years, led by um, François Germain at the University of Liège in Belgium. Um, there's four large areas of research working on the causal linkages between climate and environmental changes, habitability, perceptions and changes in habitability, um, and how that translates into mobility. Um, the second one, how local adaptation and interconnected adaptation aspects um, can mitigate changes in, in habitability and can influence that. Um, and the third and fourth one are referring to specifically um, local and uh, regional levels of inequality and gender and intersectional um, justice and how then this can be transferred into policy making on the national and local, but also on the international level. Um, as I said, it's a fairly large project. It has um, five primary research areas in Eastern and Western Africa and Southeast Asia, and secondary research sites in, uh, in Western Africa and Southern Africa. Um, it's a large inter, or let's say transdisciplinary uh, approach, um, bringing in, as uh, um, Alex already sketched out, um, um, quantitative methods, modeling, um, but also qualitative approaches, um, assessing the uh, localized and, um, and cultural and, um, and uh, ethnographic uh, aspects of perceptions. Um, yeah, maybe that's the, the one thing. What I want to be talking about today is more a conceptual approach because we are still uh, working through our data. I think the first data in all the work packages are coming in now. Um, so I'm afraid I can't present you even interim results, but we have been working on the concepts and redefining and reshaping them. Um, the key working definitions of the project or the working definition of habitability is um, habitability is defined as the capacity of the or capability of social ecological systems to sustain and to support the lives and livelihoods of constituent populations. Pretty, pretty basic and bold one. Um, that's not too far away, I guess, from, from uh, what uh, David just, just presented, um, put it to different words and, uh, and uh, concepts, I guess. The key idea here is that we have, we combine two perspectives. On the one hand, a systems-based approaches on the drivers and the, um, the influencing factors um, that make habitability change or the constituents, you could say, of habitability, especially to capture the dynamic um, um, systems behavior and the dynamic interactions between climate impacts, habitability changes, and human mobility, and also then different other drivers of, of migration. And the second aspect is to combine this with a human-centered um, uh, view with an emphasis on perceptions and experiences of habitability and changes of habitability. Um, with that said, um, I want to give you now a brief introduction of work that we have been doing in the past uh, one and a half years, um, looking um, more on the drivers, the aspects that shape changes in habitability. Um, so what we heard from, from David is, uh, um, is more for what is habitability? How is this defined? How can we assess habitability? What we also want to look into in the, or what we're also looking into in the Habitable project is what drives habitability. And of course, and this is important, there are geobiophysical changes um, in climate related changes, right? Temperature, precipitation, but also other environmental changes, biodiversity, salinization of soils, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are really important parts of the social ecological systems part um, influencing habitability. But there are three aspects I think that really matter. First, 
Habitability is not the same for everyone. It is intersectionally differentiated. Second, habitability is very strongly influenced by teleconnectivities, by uh, forces from outside of given social ecological systems. Uh, system. And habitability is also very strongly shaped by local and external social economic processes. What does that mean? Well, um, if we talking, oh, sorry, if we talk about uh, intersectional differentiation of habitability, two things appear very, very, um, if, if we, but while researching that very, very uh, prominently, habitability doesn't affect all the people in the same way. That depends a lot of how people interact with places. Um, that refers, for example, to key livelihood types. Um, and Alex referred to that already. Like dryland savanna, for example, might be perfectly habitable for pastures, but virtually uninhabitable for agricultural systems that might need more water, like rice farming, for example. Right? Or, for example, gendered livelihoods. Um, key uh, example would be small home gardening or livestock keeping that might be possible in certain areas and not possible in other areas. Um, and the other one, this is more a micro scale thing, um, location of agriculture plots. We have, we have found that prominently that, for example, in one given location, land that is higher on slopes might suffer um, more drastically from, from droughts or rainfall decreases than land in floodplains, vice versa lower lying plots suffer more from flooding and, 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 um, and extreme uh, rainfall events than higher lying areas. Um, so there are micro fine grained differences in, in habitability that are linked to the way how people interact with place and, uh, and the um, bio social and bio biophysical resources there. But habitability and the changes are also affecting people to different degrees different and depending on the social position of, uh, of, of uh, individuals and groups. Um, depending, for example, uh, belonging to, to certain ethnic or social groups um, might lead to exclusion of resource use. So we have very unequal habitability of places um, uh, depending on, on, the, on the social groups that people belong to. Then re the resource endowment of individual household and um, um, the, the redistribution mechanisms that are often in place within communities um, uh, and the degree to which they function or do not function might make a, habitability, a place very unequally habitable for different households. And then if we have uh, as further zoomed down, even on an individual level, um, habitability might be very different for individual members of households, depending on gender, age, um, Etc. Um, so there's a very fine-grained differentiation of uh, um, habitability um, along inter intersecting axes of social differentiation. Then habitability is uh, very strongly shaped by teleconnectivity. Places are never existing, maybe some are, but the majority of places are not existing isolated from other places, right? Um, Edger and, and colleagues in, in, in an earlier paper um, already suggested different ways or systems uh, exchanges um, how places are connected through biophysical flows, water, carbon, nutrient cycles, etc. Through material and immaterial structures, roads, canals, uh, but also social networks, market institutions, um, policies, etc. And then through practices and flows of resources of people, finances, materials, products, ideas, aspirations, migrants, remittances, et cetera. Um, the outcomes of these interconnections of habitability can be positive for a place and a given group of people, or can be negative if resources are being extracted, right? Then one really important factor that needs to be taken into account is the power of governments and large powerful actors like corporations in shaping habitability, um, both in increasing or decreasing it. Um, just, just as a number of examples, without uh, being having the, the, the um, a comprehensive view here, but um, powerful actors like governments can create places and create habitability in places. Think of mining uh, towns and and uh, and. Um, and, uh, and places that are created artificially, right? 
Um, they can support populations with subsidies, provision of infrastructure, free water, irrigation, etc. Um, governments, but also especially corporations, uh, can decrease the habitability of a place by the exploitation of resources. Think of mining, extractive industries, uh, groundwater, etc. Um, but they also define institutional frameworks for the exchange relations um, that I referred earlier to, markets, policies, trade relations, um, exchange relations, etc. And they can deliberately reduce habitability by destruction of war, conflict. Just think of bombing the, the heating infrastructure um, of Ukraine by, by Russia in the ongoing war in the last winter. Um, and then in addition to uh, the very important uh, geobiophysical aspects that are um, influencing habitability, as, as David referred to, uh, we have social, cultural, economic aspects that are really important for shaping the local perceptions of, uh, of habitability. Um, these are on the one hand social structures, um, power imbalances, institutions, norms, gender roles, um, think back of the social differentiation of habitability. Um, then local perceptions, um, experiences, identities, when referring to a place, place attachment is a very strong and important concept here but also practices of land use, for example, routines, social discourses of who is talking about, uh, about um, habitability of a given place in what ways with what um, institutional power and backing, um, thinking of, of um, valued objectives for adaptation, for example. Um, so if we think about um, effective, I, 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 I was I found it hard to, to to think about the right term here. Let's say effective assessments of habitability. What do we need to in, take into account um, if we want to think about habitability and understand the processes that change and shape habitability? I think in in balancing these objective perspectives that that David uh, referred to, and these are important. I'm not saying we need to put them away. And I think uh, if we're talking about this. Uh, this uh, long-standing debate between um, 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 biophysical determinisms, I guess just there's a certain degree and there's a certain, there are cases on a continuum where these matter more and there are cases where they matter less, where social and local perspectives and aspects matter more. Local knowledge is a very important aspect that needs to be taken into account here if we want to come up with socially inclusive, inclusive and equitable approaches in supporting adaptation or um, the maintain, maintain, maintenance of habitability. Then habitability, as, as I said, is differentiated along very fine-grained intersecting lines of uh, difference and inequality. That means if we have a gradual loss of habitability that doesn't happen at the same time for everyone, places might or will become very probably uninhabitable earlier for some and later for other people. That means we need to tailor um, actions that are meant to stabilize habitability um, in a very specific way for given contexts. Then coming from the connected nature of habitability, I think three aspects are, in my view, important to consider here. Um, we need to take on a multi-scale perspective here especially given the importance of outside actors in many cases, um, by, uh, by uh, taking on, for example, approaches of political ecology or uh, political economy in looking for the, the multi-scale drivers of uh, changes in, on, on different levels. I think it is important to consider these connections because they might stabilize Think of remittances, think of exchange relations that might be very obvious, but it might be also very hard to assess and to see from an outside view. They might conceal gradual losses of habitability until a point where then uh, we are crossing tipping points or thresholds and tipping points uh, might appear that might not be visible early on or easy if we don't think about the interconnected nature and stabilizing power of these relations and exchanges. And uh, lastly, um, this is a bit of a controversial point, but I think we need to see human mobility not only as part of a problem or as a problem per se. Of course it is when it comes to um, involuntary displacement or involuntary immobility, 
but also as part of solutions when mobility and migration do happen um, in uh, situations of choice and the freedom is there to decide to move or not to move. Um, and lastly, I think um, all these together um, at least point me towards um, talking and thinking about climate justice in an interconnected way. In the European Union, we have this amazingly large system of, Europe, uh, of, of uh, um, agricultural subsidies stabilizing livelihoods in rural areas that might otherwise be depopulating. Um, this is absolutely unquestioned and totally, mostly unquestioned and totally normal. Um, when we talk to people in, in other countries, um, whether it might be an idea to subsidize people in, in, in areas that might be otherwise become less inhabitable, or we have gradual decline of habitability, this is very often rejected, but you know, this, this is impractical, it cannot be done. Why, why, does it, why is it impractical? Why is it impossible to think like that? If we talk about global responsibilities and um, um, climate justice on, on the interconnected levels of scale and on a global level, um, it might be well the case talking about um, stabilizing um, um, support um, also in the long run for populations um, that might be not willing or not, not um, um, uh, res or resisting, for example, relocation and, and resettlement. Carol Fobotko had this wonderful input in, on our current cyber seminar on the Pacific, where local populations resist debates and discourses of relocation. Um, so this, what I just want to raise here, this, uh, this totally normal discourse that we have in the European Union, for example, and I guess in, in other places uh, as well, um, we should at least be free to think about that on the, on the global level. Yes, I want to conclude here, and, and, and uh, I'm looking forward for a hopefully lively and interesting discussion. So thank you very much, and uh, looking forward to questions and uh, remarks. Thank you, Harold. For those of you in the room, I have links where you can start. We've got really rich material to draw on for a kind of discussion and hopefully fairly open and free flowing one. So um, maybe we can just uh, see some hands. I'll, I'll bring up some of the questions that we had posed during the Pern Cyber Seminar, but I believe there's <laughs> plenty of others that may have arisen uh, as we presented. So let me just um, do that while people are thinking. Is there a hand up I here? I have a question from the uh, virtual participants, okay. if, I, if we well, can start with that. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure, we can start with that, Great. Elizabeth. Okay. It's uh, Sarah Rosengartner from the Global Center for Climate Mobility. And she says, it seems to me that in engaging the question of habitability, you may be facing a dilemma. Normatively, you want to set the standard for habitability so that it supports the development of human capability. But empirically, people may be staying in areas that already today do not meet these criteria. What does it mean then for people to live in places that are considered uninhabitable? And I think she was directing her question towards David's presentation, David. Yeah, yeah. so why don't you go ahead and sit up here, David. I might have to manage some controls, but I'll try to sit as well in a moment. Um, so, David, over to you. Yeah, so that's, uh, do I turn this thing? Can you hear me okay? Speak just, closer just to it. Just speak closely to it. Yeah, so, the, uh, we've been joking around, this is a, it's like Schrodinger's earth, right? Like you, by observing the thing, you determine the thing. And, um, and I mean, I, yeah, I just, I, I agree with the sentiment that um, by commenting on the thing, you predispose it. And I think this goes, this goes back a long way. We've contended with this in different disciplines and areas, uh, you know, looking at human environment interactions, studying it as a, as a proposition. Um, but I, I think it's a point well taken. And, and so this is like, you know, there was a uh, discussion in the last session on the power of maps. And I would say that, um, yeah, <laughs> there's a sort of colonial historical character to the sort of research that makes determinations like this. And so we just, I mean, at the same time, yeah, yeah, I, I, I take the point. I take the point. Um, at the same time, there's a there's this justice argument to to do this work as well, um, especially as we move into the you know the era of loss and damage, where we really need to to document uh, 
instances when habitability has been lost so that we can think ahead to um, you know, issue, issues of reparations. I know that's a fraught term in the, term in the, in the climate negotiations, but so I, I just, I, what do we do? Can we have a hand up here, Roland, and we'll get to you next, Susie. Hi, I think this is um, going to David as well. Um, referring, I, I think you've covered this within your equation, but but if I can tease it out slightly in my head, that you gave the example of the village that was flooded. Um, and obviously then you have a extreme rate of hab habitability change. Uh, and you said it's, it, you know, you would, it, um, but the adaptation measure conceptually could be to build a levee to stop mm -hmm. that flood coming in yeah now if you build that levee uh are you actually changing the habit the habitability of those villages in terms of how do we engage ideas of threat and perceived threat to the concept of habitability i think it's in the s of the safety of your equation but i was just trying to understand because building a, a levee could actually degrade, you know, it's harder to get fishing boats out, so you're actually reducing it, but you are preempting a habitability change. And it does strike me that habitability itself is, is an important concept, but actually what's more useful is delta habit habitability, which is the rate of change, either degrees of shift or, or speed of shift that would have the impact, if you so see what I, I mean. I do. So I think I do. So there's a, a, an issue that arises when we think about um, cumulative compounding risk in, in places like deltas, where adaptation is simply prolonging the inevitable, right? Um, you're, you're building a series of embankments and in, in levees that will eventually be breached. But the argument, I mean, there is an argument. I don't know. I don't know if I'm the person to answer it. I, there might be someone in the room. I mean, I, I have to approach this with a, a huge degree of humility because um, for I, and, the, and then, of course, what I would, would do is, is say it depends on the context, um, that, that that sort of formalization needs to be contextualized. It has to be done uh, for every instance of, of habitability. So um, it could be that, that uh, habitability could, could be extended for decades or centuries, um, depending on the context, and that transformations could occur in, uh, in economies and livelihoods that would... Um, it would, it, life would look very different, but it could be prolonged in those places. Um, and and I, I hate to say it depends on the context. It's just such a it's such a dodge, but I think in this case it's true. Yeah. Susie. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. So one builds on the question that we had first. Um, I forget her name. Who just asked it about people staying actually in places. I wonder if that's not a really, really interesting um, context uh, to improve on your um, your mathematical mathematical model of habitability, which is to get at the other reasons people stay in places. <laughs> it feels to me super simplistic to bring it down to safety and um, and livelihood. I mean, they're, they're, they were important factors, don't get me wrong, but it just feels to me we have a lot of evidence of people staying in places that are well past safe and well past, you know, making a life livelihood there. And yeah. so what are those factors? And, you know, can we maybe get at improved models um, by looking at exactly those places where people stay past, past the safe, past livelihood? And, and the second is, since this is a fairly you know, it's, it's top down in the sense of being driven by two factors and you look how they play out all over the world. Can we maybe use, you know, modern technologies like AI or whatever to have it be driven from the bottom up? Why do you people, why do people stay in places and compare those two maps? Um, I think it would be really interesting to, to just, you know, better understand um sort of how long um you live in a landscape maybe of perceived dignity um before you actually give up so anyway just questions about that yeah um so just uh to respond the first part of the, the first question was around um why do people stay and so you know i presented this case in which a community on the on a, a sandy uh barrier island essentially or a bar barrier peninsula 
was no longer able to live there. And so that in, in those instances, we're, we're talking about open water, open ocean, and it's not, it's physically, there are physically, we could, you could conceive of a life in that, in, a, in, an, in the open ocean, we could do that. That would require in really enormous uh, investments in terms of, you know, the, the capacity for adaptation would have to be incredible to maintain life on the open ocean, but it's conceivable. Um, yeah, so why do people stay there? So it's it's not like everybody who experienced the flooding, um, you know, the, it was uneven. There are degrees of impact that happen across the community. And many people tried to stay or did stay or moved in with relatives whose houses were unaffected. And at the same time, there were people who moved away who were unaffected just simply because of the perception that their, their individual determination about um, that. So the, the example that I was going to give is that, you know, in these communities, just to simplify the local economy, there are fishermen, there are fishing cooperatives and fish wholesalers, and then there are fish markets. And then there are ranchers and farmers. And so what happened is that the flooding impacts occurred to the fishermen mostly. And so all the fishing boats were washed away, all the docks were washed away, fishing wasn't really possible. But that led to this sort of cascade in the in the livelihood system. So the, the wholesalers went out of business and the fishing cooperative went out of business. And because of that, the, the, the markets found other sources. And so they stopped buying from this community. And because of the, the fishermen were out of work, they needed to move. And because the fishermen all moved, it was an important disruption to the local economy. Um, and so the ranchers started to move as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we, we, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. 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 The complexity of it, right? Yeah. The ripple effects and that social mm -hmm. dimension, the in, yep. intra-community yeah. dimensions, I think are really critical. Yeah, yeah. so the, I mean, so that, that's why I conceive this as a social ecological phenomenon, right? It's a, it's, and we're talking about a state shift um, in, a, in, a, in a system. Um, the second, the second part of your question, I'm, my memory is so terrible. It was, it, it was about using AI or something oh, like that to kind of uh, get at the from the bottom up at what people perceive as habitable. And well, maybe I could. I uh, so this is the subject of the paper that uh, Radley and Alex and Michael and myself wrote. The the need for top down, bottom up assessments, and so we have very few examples of top down, bottom up assessments of this sort of this nature. But we can refer to a couple of them. So Andrew Bell, who's at this conference, I don't think he's in the room. Um, who is on that paper? Beth, were you on that paper as well? The um, the Bang Bangladesh, yeah. It's a this is a good example of a top down, bottom up um, assessment. And so what we did is we looked at um, it was an agent based model that uh, was meant to simulate migration o over different climate scenarios, different um, RCPs, over different time scales. And what we showed was that, um, yeah, as the sea level rises, as risk accumulate, as flooding risk impacts accumulate, that people actually migrate towards the coast. And um, and it's a really good, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it also makes sense. The theory would support that kind of thing. People moving towards cities, towards the coast, as um, impacts happen. Um, but it's a really good example. You know, the assumption is people will move away from sea level rise, but we have this really nice top-down, bottom-up um, methodology that that tells us a really important story. Um, so yeah, that's a point well taken. We make that argument. I don't know. Do you have anything to add to that? I was just going to say, you know, ABM is bottom up in the sense it's very th theory driven and based on you know a lot of observational <laughs> data. I wouldn't necessarily equate it with going out and talking. So Helen Adams, you know, has done, and she also was part of our assessing project that you led. And she went and did interviews in rural Bangladesh and found that people, you know, there was very strong differences in the way people might perceive the willingness and perceive risk and perceive willingness to actually move that has to do with place attachment and those social bonds and other things. But Helen, um, or Ellen, if you don't mind, go ahead and... Yeah, um, I guess I had a question more for you, Alex, but everybody can respond. Um, I was really struck by what you said about how, you know, whether, you know, there were pros and cons to having kind of a top down definition of habitability, but not having that, there were also pros and cons to kind of the laissez faire approach of just letting either individuals or market forces deciding what habitability meant. And I was wondering whether you could comment a little more as to what's your perception of how policymakers think about this in the sense that do they realize that not, you know, 
trying to define particularly habitability in whichever way is also a way to defend habitability, but just, you know, in a more indirect, less fair approach. Yeah, I, I think that, so this, this gets at the sort of political aspects and who defines, who gets to define and how, what then does that trigger in terms of policy action and stuff. I think in most parts of the world, there's not a lot of policy there that, you know, there's not a lot of capacity for the government to really intervene in any significant way. So it is a lot, it's left up to people to make those individual determinations. I don't know about Honduras in depth, but I know the parts of the Sahel that I worked in, um, that the government capacity is really limited. And so, um, so yeah, if we, but, I don't know, even if the government were to define habitability, their ability to kind of intervene in some way that would uh, prevent those thresholds from being breached might be limited, but you could then go to international donors or aid agencies and some of them. I mean, the reason that, to be honest, you know, if you go back to the origins of the groundswell work that we did, the World Bank was saying, you know, Part of what they're saying is, well, you know, we invest a lot in irrigated agriculture, we invest in this and that, um, but are there areas of the world where, you know, it's kind of like you're just going to be pouring good money after bad, to use that expression, and, you know, is there, you know, so that's, that come, becomes somewhat worrisome, though, if you want to actually support people in place, and they also, I think, had, frankly, some naive ideas that if you developed, uh, better farming and you know climate smart agriculture stuff that people are still going to stay in place and i actually think those are really kind of naive assumptions about what the calculus that people are making individually about whether they're going to move or not just to add to that richard black who led the foresight work did some really interesting work recently in west africa and he basically went to the field with a bunch of people and asked people you know, about their intentions to migrate. And what they found was basically migration was a contingency plan that was a, really in everybody's mind. Like there were very few people they talked to who didn't consider that migration might be an option at some time in the future, which means that it's always, um, you know, kind of out there and whether they work, act on it sooner or later is, you know, uh, and, and maybe never. But um, I, I know your hand was up over here, Kian. Did you want to still ask a question? Yeah, I had a question about the model. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Use the mic, sorry. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the kind of literature I'm educating myself on, the kind of literature you come from. But um, I'm just curious about the way in which you do or do not integrate uh, the body of literature from economics. I mean, location choice is at the core of urban economics. It's a well-known, it's a very large body of, um, you know, of concepts and uh, results. So I, I'm just curious how you built that in. Habitability is obviously, it's, a, it's, it's part of a utility function. I mean, you talked about agental models, uh, individual decisions to move. These are well modeled in, in that literature. Mm -hmm. It, does it overlap with your uh, with your approach? Uh, how do you integrate it in? And the idea of habitability, I guess, is uh, uh, the idea of trade-offs. Uh, how does that get built into your model? I mean, all people trade off amenities and costs and benefits. So I guess that's my question. How does how does a, basically a, a kind of utility approach and cost-benefit approach get built into your model? Well, this is this is we can we can perhaps divide the answers between us, and I don't uh, mean to jump in. That's a really good question. So um, to to parse it out, um, there is the groundswell report, which does uh, bring in some of these assumptions about assumptions about location choice. I mentioned the Bell paper, which is a uh, discrete. What do we? How do we? How do we describe this? I want um, Andrew to say <laughs> to describe it for me, but. The, the idea is that um, any, any person pursuing a set of livelihoods has a discrete set of choices. They can either do this or that. And they're income generating activities and they're location based. Um, so these activities are available in this location, those activities are available in that location. And so an individual has got to optimize based on their, their, you know, their time, uh, which, which choices are best. So of course this comes from the, um, you know, on, on that project also is Valerie Mueller, who's a labor economist. Um, and this comes from the 
we could we could talk about the um, demographic methods that would be used to approach some of these topics, the new economics of labor migration, which also is an, the, the idea is that um, you know migration is a spatial sorting of labor, right? Like people are are pursuing livelihood opp opportunities spatially. Um, they move to the city because that's where livelihoods are. Um, so I would say all of this is informed by these perspectives. I mean, all uh, the, lots of us in the room come from a migration studies perspective who, that take all of this on board. Um, I don't know if that gets to your. I guess I just didn't see it reflected. In yeah. The, how is it reflected in your? So, um, so did you have your hand up, Bradley? Maybe there's. For our next question. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, so we did. Well, I was I was thinking I, of the. Paper. Some of this could be a bilateral that you do. You know. But yeah. yeah. If you want to unpack it a little bit more. Um, we wrote on this in the science paper, and so that yeah, the, this is this is addressed to some extent. Yeah, uh, Radley, thanks. And Harold, if you want to intervene in any way, uh, just raise your hand. Someone in the room will see you, and we'll call on you to speak. Sorry, to, we don't want to exclude you. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, David, I think you might have actually alluded to this right at the start of the Q and A, and I wonder if that actually prompted me thinking about this. But I hadn't really thought about how just the discussions of habitability or the, the idea of declaring a place uninhabitable directly affects perceptions of livelihood, perceptions of adaptive capacity, whether maybe in the spirit of the individual and their sense of hope, or in the narratives that they might feel they have to attach to about, um, you know, the, we might get abandoned at a larger scale by by support networks. So it's just, I guess it's a classic kind of wicked, wicked problem. But there's that the, the perception piece, which that then sort of impacts is. Yes. That that seems like something you might want to inter, um, talk about, Harold. Um, the kind of declaration of a place being. I, I will just say one thing. I traveled to Gansu province with a former graduate student um, in uh, China, and uh, they have a massive ecological uh, relocation, or my, they call it ecological migration. It's uh, sort of euphemistic, but they basically kind of say, we're not going to provide services to you anymore. You're up in these hills, are, hill areas. They're semi-arid. They're your sheep herders and growing grain, but the, the, the rains aren't very reliable. We're going to essentially pull out and you can buy uh, actually at some cost, it's not insubstantial, but subsidized uh, a structure in a house down in the valley in the, in the, in along the, where they pipe in water from the Yellow River. And it's a pretty huge effort uh, to get people out of those marginal environments into the kind of what they call oasis communities. And um, uh, I think, you know, I looked at it as kind of had some pros and cons. Um, there, there definitely was, there were people who resisted and stayed in those communities up in the village, even though there's no electricity or postal service anymore. Uh, some of the houses are falling down around them. Uh, and, and so it wasn't complete authoritarian, you will leave, but um, uh, it did sort of show what can happen once you start pulling out some of those supports. Harold, did you want to say something? Sorry, yeah, I see your hand. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You're muted. That, you need uh, to unmute. Sorry. Ah, I actually I'm Maybe unmuted. Volume but, uh, in the back. Ah, hello, hello, hello. Does that work? Try saying. Oh, we see your. Yes, lips. I'm saying something. Um. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. There, I mean, there, there are at least two things that I think are important to consider here. Uh, the, the one that we talked about is. Who, who has the right to define, or let's say not define, this, this is a conceptual and epistemological uh, approach, right? Defining habitability, that's the one thing. Who has the right to declare a degree of habitability or inhabitability, and who does that? And, and that's the second thing, what are the consequences, right? I mean, we have enough examples where, um, uh, think of a Typhoon uh, Haiyan in the Philippines, um, displacing millions of people, uh, of whom ten thousands could not return to their to their areas of residence because the government simply declared regions as unsafe for residents, basically the same as uninhabitable. Um, lots of people returning illegally, having no access to to social services, etc. Right. So what does that mean? 
Um, I think this is a super important question that needs to be raised on top of all that we are talking about in terms of definitory, conceptual, um, and other perspectives here. It, it's a different kind of questions, right? It's a, it's, it's a very deeply um, ethical and political question um, and that has that needs a space of, of discourse and, and discussion on its own, I guess. It's linked to what we are talking in terms of defining and measuring habitability and looking at who has a say in, let's say, or, or whom do we include in measuring and habitability, right? If we have bottom up and um, and top down, and if you combine these 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 perspectives, that's one thing. The second is who defines, who has the final say in saying, okay, now we declare something. That's a political process normally. Um, and what happens? What is the next? Are people relocated against their will? Are people compensated? Are people supported? Well, this place can be declared uninhabitable. That means either you have to leave or you can stay and you get compensation or you get subsidies for living there. This There's a there's a light here of difference in between that uh, in terms of what it means for people. That's what I meant with, let's think open and raise this question. I think uh, there was years and years ago, I think Ottmar Edenhofer from Pitt raised this thing of uh, global agricultural commons. Uh, that was like, uh, I think 2006 or seven or something like that. So if we have um, not even calling it un or habitability or loss of habitability or loss of damage, but if we have places that get less and less favorable for doing agriculture, who needs to feed the world? That was his take. Um, so we need probably global agricultural commons where this will be still possible in high agricultural output regions. We could think a similar process, like what does that mean in terms of subsidizing people's um, dignified or staying in dignity? Or does it necessarily mean people have to leave? I think this is a very important question that needs to be talked about. And the other one, I think, um, I guess the the what is important. And that's I think also um, an aspect that it's I think it's difficult to include in quantitative models or even in assessments with AI the role that um, let's say local perceptions, bounded rationalities in migration research. Um, that's a very common concept. People decide um, do take this mobility decisions in uh, bounded rationalities, right? So you don't measure temperature and look on the thermometer or in the rainfall gauge, but you perceive changes. Or, and I think perception is a, it's a very senseful word. I would rather say they conceive of changes and of risks. And these underlie local discourses. National discourses, global discourses have influences on national discourses, but also local discourses. So who talks about changing habitability, attractiveness of a place. How do valued objectives change over time in places and for whom? This is not the same for, for, for everyone in the community. I think that necess necessitates very local views that needs to be um, juxtaposed with um, top-down approaches of uh, biogeophysical changes. But I think that's something that we need to do and it's therefore it's important <laughs> to include local okay. people. We're gonna Sorry. have to, we're gonna, Maybe we'll go over by five or so minutes just because there's a lot of hands up. But what I'm going to do is ask each of you to state your question and we're going to go one after the other so we can get to everybody. So um, maybe starting with Cascade and then Simona and then Beth, sorry. That'll wake everyone up. So I'll keep it brief um, and it's for all three of you. But if you take David's framework of, of safety and livelihoods, have you at least into, or like mentally inverted it to think about the cost of safety and livelihoods for those who are living in uh, ecologically uninhabitable locations who are very wealthy. So I think about Dubai, coastal California, and the relationship between the cost of that and then the cost of the communities you're talking about and how there's inherent, I mean, if we think of it like a tragedy of a common situation, there's inherent finite amount of resources to sustain both. And how do you buy in those in Malibu uh, in this broader system. Yeah, we when we were talking oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll answer my question in the context of answering this one. Um, but so I have a question about um, actually this like establishing of a basic level threshold and the way that you're defining it. There seems to be like, um, or I'm curious about to what extent a temporal aspect is involved here. 
So um, it feels more obvious to point to like, yes, it's hard to live on the open ocean kind of cases. But what about cases in which people like epistemically don't have really you know, strong beliefs in the capacity for the institutions to persist around them for X period of time? Would we regard a certain threshold of when they make those epistemic adjustment, uh, you know, uh, judgments as actually then overshooting the habitability threshold? And so it, it seems like there's this spatial aspect, but there is also this like temporal axis in there. So I'm, I'm curious about how you reflect on that. Uh, and then it's Beth over here. You know, my question was actually very much along the lines of Simone's, which is as much a comment, but, um, you know, the temper, temporal nature of this makes a great difference, but I also think about the period in between shocks, and that the shocks, when they come more and more frequently, they sort of accelerate all of these uh, individual decisions in a way that, um, the the equation that you put up on the on the, the equation that you showed us could be something that changes very much very quickly over time. So it's temporality and uh, compounding, and because of the of the lack of a time in between shocks to recover. Okay, now you can speak. Okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So on the on the first one, we, we, we imagined, yeah, I mean, if you have if you have large uh, capacity to to adapt, you might imagine very uh, arid, very hot, extensive land where that are essentially, you know, air conditioned um, kingdoms or whatever, you know, it's like air, a whole area where life is only possible because of air conditioning, living in a bubble and, and yet it's possible. Um, and so I don't know if that's getting to it, but yes, certainly, yeah, we can imagine, and that's easy to imagine. We can just clearly imagine that. And so, like, when we think into the distant future, uh, habitability would depend on on those sorts of, of inputs. I'm so. I, how much should I just briefly <laughs> speak to some of these? The 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 next point was on on speed, institutions, and and sort of the speed. I, I referenced this. I just put it up there just for a moment to to talk about. Um, yeah, the instances in which uh, we, we might sort of uh, change might occur too fast versus a high baseline. You know, you're adapting to a, 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 high, a very difficult con conditions that have remained stable but difficult over time versus kind of the, uh, a rate of, of change in the circumstances that you need to adjust to. And so if you, if you are without the tools, which tend to take time to develop, then that can be a, that's a, that's a, a limit. That's a barrier to adaptation. And so I'll just I'll just say that. And then this um, Beth that that remind that's you know we're, this is situated in the um, adapt, complex adaptive systems framework, which you know resilience, which understands um, the sort of um, we think about disturbances and the rate of disturbances and recovery, and and if those occur too quickly, then then you this can you know result in a in a, some sort of state change. And there's a, there's a lot of tools for thinking of that, and that's a very important insight. Yeah, when do we, you know, it becomes so expensive every year to replace this infrastructure. At what point do we, can we no longer afford it? Mm -hmm. Great, well, I'm sure there's more questions and a lot more to discuss, but this has been really helpful for us, I know, in sharpening yeah, yeah. our thinking. Thank so thank, thank you so you, much, thank you, thank you. and we really appreciate your turning out yeah. today for this session. Bye, Harold. Bye. Thanks a lot, bye-bye. Bye-bye.